I want to welcome everyone to our Academia School of the Prophets. Uh, right now, we're in a brand new module called The Art of Prayer, and we're actually on part two of The Art of Prayer. What we're going to do, we're going to go to our um, proof text. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse 1. 1 John chapter 1. We're going to verse 1. It says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life and the life was revealed and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which is with the father and was revealed to us. Verse three, what we have seen and heard, we do proclaim to you also. It says so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. So one of the things that we want to uh, kind of lay hold of is that what God has given us in Christ Jesus is what we call eternal life. I want you guys to type in that word, eternal life. Um, when the Bible speaks of eternal life, in John chapter 17, verse 2, it says, just as you gave him authority over all mankind, so that to all you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Um, when you look at that word life in the Greek, it's the word zoe. The word zoe, you know, in the 90s, you know, it's very popular. People talk about zoe life. Um, but zoe life is a life um, that is intuitive, a life um, that is life-given, it is a life of illumination. So what Jesus has done, Jesus is the true light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. So when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he lights your candle. Where we get this from, back in the day, I don't know if I still had that same picture, but I had a, I had a webinar I did in 2017 called Developing the Human Spirit. And it will be a picture of a candle, you know, and sometimes people think you, you know, lost your mind. Why, why you got a, a candle for that? But my spirit is the candle of the Lord. So what God does is God lights my candle, giving me illumination. Right. So the ultimate goal of Christianity, um, and I don't like being so definitive when I say these certain things. So one of the pathways of Christianity and I keep saying this word pathway, so I believe my spirit is aware of something that my mind is catching up to. But one of the pathways that we engage in is the pathway of illumination. And Jesus said it this way. He says, if a person follows me, he will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. Now, what Jesus has done to you is Jesus has lit your candle and given you access to illumination. And when a believer walks on the pathway of illumination, the path of the just, it gets brighter and brighter into that perfect day, which means that we're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. Now, eternal life illuminates you. An individual who does not possess eternal life can only know about God from secondhand knowledge. They have no experience of God but they are limited to other people's accounts. But when you receive illumination, God illuminates or he lights the candle of your spirit. And now the spirit of God indwells your spirit and he's searching all the inner depths of the heart. One of the things we have to remember, there's a parable in the Bible where it talks about the five foolish and the five wise virgins, you know? And a lot of times it's been likened to the last days. But I want to pull it from another construct. One of the things that that parable speaks to is a difference between people who live from the outside in and the inside out. The foolish felt as if they needed something outside of the house, but the wise had something inside the house. One of the things you have to be aware of is when you receive Christ, you receive all things that pertain to life and godliness. You don't need anything else. You just need light. There's nothing else you need but illumination. And the illumination comes from the relationship that you establish with God. You know, and um, one of the things I do want to speak to is in this school, we have 
um, emerging leaders. We have emerging ministers, right? And I want to deconstruct the theory of what you um, esteem to be ministry. Um, there's a lot of people who have grandioso ideas of being some sort of charismatic superhero for Christ, not realizing that the important thing, the priority is you establishing a healthy, expanding, vibrant relationship with the presence of God, more so than you being, you know, um, one of the greatest ministers that ever lived, you need to cultivate the daily practice of practicing the presence of God, because you will not change one life if you don't know God. The best you would do without an active relationship with God is make a proselyte, and what you're going to do is you're going to make them twice a son of hell than yourself. Now, what you want to do is practice the presence of God because God is present. The issue is, are you experiencing his presence? Because God is present. His name is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord ever present. Are you benefiting from the presence of God that is within, upon, and around you at all times? Now, those who don't pray are like prunes. They're withering. They're decaying. Um, they're not growing. They're not expanding. But when you engage in the ha habitual discipline of prayer, what begins to happen is you begin to um, reap the fruit of what comes from prayer. Now, what prayer, um, one of the things that empowers us to pray is what we call eternal life. So there is an intuitive relationship. When I say intuitive, what does the word intuitive mean? You know, we 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 get the word intuitive from the word intuition. And when we talked about developing the human spirit, um, there are different, um, there, there, is a, uh, there is an anatomy of the spirit, the anatomy of the human spirit, you know, upon, you know, um, growth, I realized that there are nine gateways of the spirit. But one of the gateways of the spirit is what we call intuition. Now, intuition is a direct knowing, something that cannot be understood, cannot be explained, you just know. Now, spiritual maturity, um, the pathway to spiritual maturity is where an individual is living from the inside out, uh, which means as we're coming into the position of sonship, there are going to be things that we know that we can't understand, but time will help us understand what we knew. This is why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It says, acknowledge him in all your ways and what? He'll direct your path. Now, an intuitive relationship with God means that God dwells within your spirit. And there are things that God himself wants you to know. And when God wants you to know things, he deposits revelation in your spirit through the incubatory space of relationship. Relationship releases revelation. I'm going to say that again. Relationship releases revelation. It is the practice of relationship that releases revelation. When an individual lacks revelation, you can always trace it to the lack of relationship because guidance is a byproduct of walking with God. If you walk with God, he will guide you. It is impossible for you to walk with God and have no direction and no guidance. But what happens to us is we desire the benefits of God without the relationship with God. We want the provision of God. We want the esteem of God. We want the influence in God. We want the favor of God, but we don't want to know him. And God is willing to withhold the fringe benefits in order for you to um, prioritize what's important. You know, a lot of us just want to obtain things from God. Listen, your relationship with God cannot be transactional. My relationship with God is not about what God has done for me lately. My relationship with God is about coming into the knowledge of who he is that affects the way I live, the way I speak, the way I perceive, the way I walk. So I'm on a, a, a pathway or a journey of coming into the understanding of who God really is. 
but I have not come into understanding unless it's changed me. See, a lot of us collect facts, but we don't transform. You know, just because you can, you know, tell me 150 things about God, it does not mean you know him. But when you know God, there's a transformation that happens in you. When God reveals different aspects of his being, which he will, when God reveals different aspects of his nature, which he will, when God reveals different aspects of his ways, which he will, this is where transformation happens. So, you know, the way that we approach our relationship with God is purely mental. We approach our relationship with God as if I just want to learn things about God. But listen, if what you're learning, you can't experience, it's a waste of your time. So what we're trying to do is we're, you're going to utilize the revelation into practice. And you're going to practice what you're learning so you can experience what you heard. Because what God wants to do is take you on a journey. We're all, we're all on the journey of knowing God, right? Let's go somewhere. Let's go to Philippians chapter three. I know you may be wondering, what does God do with prayer? It has everything. Okay, we're going to go to um, Philippians chapter three, which is actually one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I remember when I was fasting um, all the time, when I was 19 to 21, this, this was really, really like... Um, heavy to me and it really resonated with my soul but watch this philippians 3 verse 1 it says finally my brothers and sisters rejoice in the lord to write the same things again is no trouble for me and it is a safeguard for you beware of dogs beware of the evil workers beware of the false circumcision you know by the way this is a warning for ministers as well you need to be aware of dogs you're gonna have evil people that um won't associate with you you're gonna have evil workers you're gonna have people that are um apostles and prophets of satan and they're gonna have the false circumcision you're gonna have people who are portraying to be believers but they're not really believers so beware verse three for we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of god and take pride in christ jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. This is the goal. Verse four, although I myself could boast as having confidence, even in the flesh, if anyone thinks he is confident in the flesh, I have more reason. Verse five, circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, I was found blameless. So one of the things that we found out is that as a believer, we worship in the spirit of God, which means that we have genuine relationship with God. Remember, the hour is coming and now is when the father sees worshipers to worship him in spirit and truth. You can't worship God in spirit and truth without eternal life. God has to come and live inside of you for you to have a relationship. So Jesus gives you access to the spirit of God. So the spirit of God indwells you, giving you the power to know God intuitively, which means that you can know things about God over a process of time that you can't understand, but then life will help you understand what you already know. So you're learning how to live out of a knowing, but relationship releases revelation. So when I engage in relationship with God, God releases revelation about himself, revelation about my destiny, revelation about my purpose, revelation about my calling, revelation about my identity. And now I live out of what God has revealed. So I don't live by bread alone. Have you eaten today? I hope so. But more important than what you ate today, what has God revealed to you today about your calling? your identity, your purpose, your destiny, or himself, right? And if God has not revealed anything to you, did you sit in the audience today? Because one of the prerequisites for hearing God, it means to sit in the audience. Many of us don't hear God because our space is vacant. How consistent are you with your attendance? I was talking to Prophet Medina today, and I was telling him how I asked him, has he experienced 
when you come into different realms of hearing God and you're not aware. And I've been feeling like Samuel, where the Lord is calling me, and I didn't know it was the Lord. But I'm realizing that God has been speaking to me in a different way. And once I perceived it to be God's voice, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm appearing. I want to make sure I sit in the audience. So when God holds class sessions or when God holds, a, 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 when God wants to speak, I'm in the vicinity. How do you enter into the vicinity of the voice of God? It's the realm of prayer. Individuals who don't pray do not develop their spirit enough to perceive when God is speaking. There are answers you're seeking from people that God blinds and hides people to just so you can develop a relationship with him. Because what a man can only know in part, what does God know? He knows everything. So why would God allow you to uh, replace relationship with an idol? When you idolize these men and women who are your comfort spaces, your, 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 um, your hiding places, your refuges that you put before God. And what happens is you hinder yourself from being able to hear God at the place you need to hear God. But what we do is we worship God in spirit and truth, which means that God lives in my spirit and I worship him by um, I worship him by a dedication. I worship him by a consecration. I worship him by a commitment, a commitment to follow his way, his, his will, his purpose, and his plan. So I'm worshiping God in spirit and truth, and I'm going to take pride or have confidence in Christ Jesus. I'm not, I'm not boasting in my own accomplishments. I'm not boasting in my own strength or my power or my might. But it's not by power or by might, but it's by his spirit. And I want to put no confidence in the flesh. Whatever I can offer, I can contribute of the flesh. I'm not going to have any confidence in it. So Paul gives his fleshly resume. His fleshly resume is, listen, I'm, I was circumcised. So I have a covenant with God according to the flesh. I'm of the, the favorite tribe. I'm of the favorite son. I'm of that particular you know tribe, Benjamin, right? I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? I love the law so much. I was made a teacher of it, an overseer of it, a Pharisee. Watch. And so my passion for God, I was so passionate. I was killing the early church because I thought it was right in the eyes of God. You can't touch my zeal. And what else? Righteousness. Nobody was trying to live by the law and please God like me. You couldn't accuse me of nothing. Perfect in the flesh. Watch verse seven. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I've counted loss because of Christ. So. When you come into the Lord, one of the things you have to realize, the Bible says, if any man think himself to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Many of us have not even entered the pathway of wisdom because we've not become a fool. People think that, like I'm using an example, just a pure example. Let's just say right now, pure example. Let's use Oprah as an example. If Oprah transferred into the kingdom of God with all her wealth, all her prestige, all her influence. She's going to come into the kingdom as a fool. She's not going to come into the kingdom as the, with the wisdom of the world. It has no bearing, no weight, no transferability. It does not transfer, right? What happens with believers is everything we attained in our flesh, we want to transfer into the kingdom as if that gives us status. Not at all. The pathway of the kingdom is from childhood to sonship. So when you come into this realm, you come in as a babe and you have the opportunity to become a son. You don't automatically become a son. There are heirs that remain children. There are heirs that will die children. As long as the heir is a child, he's no different than a slave or a servant. Think about this. If you're a millionaire, a trillionaire, and you have a family estate, you're not going to give your estate over to the immature. God has a business that he wants to transfer to his mature children. And the mature children of God will be about their father's business. But as long as you are a child, you'll never qualify for those things. You will be loved. You will be taken care of but you will not be a contributor. And sometimes you may be a stumbling block to other people because there are people who are about their father's business that you stand in the way of by your lack of growth. Um, in other words, you are a liability and not an asset. 
Now, if you just came into the kingdom, this is not pressure. You have time to grow. You have time to commit. You have time to consecrate. You have time to renew your focus. But I want to make you aware that you're on the pathway. Watch this. So everything that were gained to you in the world, you lose because of Jesus. Verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish that I may gain Christ. So the mind of a mature believer, this is important because this is why we pray. Why do I pray? Because there were things that were very important when I was in the world. But now that I transition into the realm of the kingdom, these things I was willing to lose so that what? That I can know Jesus. Knowing Jesus is not an instant thing. You don't know Jesus just because you got saved yesterday. Knowing Jesus is a lifelong journey that will unfold. What you know about Jesus today, if you're consistent, you're going to know him at a higher level next year. You're supposed to be growing in the knowledge of God. This is why we pray so that I can know him more. And this is why we prioritize prayer because everything is rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. Now, anything that you value um, equally to knowing Jesus is an idol. And you have to begin to realize that it's really rubbish. Now, people think that, okay, I'm not a minister. I'm not trying to preach. Listen, throw it out the window. Forget about ministering to people. People think that the ministers are supposed to pray for us and do the prayer. No, no, no. You need to know Jesus for yourself. There are things about Jesus that your minister may never know that God wants to reveal to you that if your minister hears you say it, you will open up a new pathway. There, there is not, there's wisdom that's been hidden before the ages for our glory. There is a wisdom I have access to you never will unless I utter it. There's a wisdom you have access to, I never will, unless you utter it. But if you're not walking in the pathway of a relationship, the positive contribution, the, the, um, the godly, um, the godly um, illumination you're supposed to attain to, the world will never benefit from. So the reason I pray is what? That I may know Christ, watch this, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them mere rubbish that I may do what? That I may gain Christ. So here's the thing. And listen, when I say this, it's going to be strong. It's going to be very strong. But Jesus said some very strong things that contemporary Christianity overlooks. If I make a status right now without saying the verse, people may be on my head. The Bible says that if you don't love me, more than your mother, your father, your sisters, and your brother, he said, you're not worthy of me. Do you know how many of us prioritize our children, our family, our work, our employment over Jesus? What does the Bible say? It says you're not worthy of him, which means you will compromise and deny him before men. I remember when I was younger, I would always be in these situations where the people that I was um, in relationship with, they loved their family so much more than they loved Jesus. But they, you know, over time were going to be the compromisers because they weren't loyal to Jesus. Because anything that you love more than Jesus, you're going to compromise to, to people, please, or to our service. And there are, there are some of us who, as parents, you're, you don't love Jesus more than your children. As children, you don't love Jesus more than your parents. As, you know, whatever, whatever realm you're in, you have to show Jesus that you're devoted to him. You have to show Jesus you're willing to sacrifice for him. You know, you have, you have all these things. Now, I want to say a verse that's not very popular. Um, and people don't know this verse is in the Bible. But I want to show you something. Well, I don't know if I want to touch that. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll leave that alone. Have mercy on me, Lord. <laughs> Let me not touch that. All right, watch this. So we're going to go to um, verse nine. Watch this. It says, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. So watch this. Why am I in pursuit of Jesus? Why am I in pursuit of the knowledge of God? Why? 
Because first of all, I want to have a righteousness that's not my own. In other words, I want to have, a, I want to be in right standing with God, not from performance. See, when you lack relationship, you want to try to perform to please God. When you lack relationship, you want to try to earn things from God, right? When, when you become religious, vain religious, not, 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 the, not the pure religion, but when you get into vain religion, you have all this external effort with no inward transformation. In other words, you have a form of godliness, but deny the power. Real godliness transforms us from the inside out. And there are times, even in my own life, where you are on the pathway of godliness and you leave that pathway. And then when you stop, when, when, when you find your morals decaying, you find your values being corrupt, you find yourself not having the same standard of um, same standard of, of faith, the same standard of godliness, the same standard of, of um, commitment, right? Consistency. Why? Because you were in the pathway of godliness, which was changing you from faith to faith and glory to glory. But now you became inconsistent in your relationship with God and you find yourself dying and decaying. You find yourself lacking strength. You find yourself compromising. You find your character colluding. You find, you find that you're becoming corrupt because you're around the wrong people. You're in environments you have no business being in. You're entertaining conversations with people you should never entertain. Why? Because you left the pathway of godliness and now you've denied the power of it. You can't, the, listen, the power of godliness is that it transforms you into Christ's likeness, which means if I say I know him, I ought to walk as he walked. So my relationship gives me the power to walk like Jesus walked. There is no relationship without consistent prayer. There's no relationship because once, what are we doing? We're practicing the presence of God. I was listening to preaching um, before I got on here. He said something deep. He said, every failure is a prayer failure. Every, pr every failure is a prayer failure. If you fail, you can trace it to the lack of prayer. Were you praying about it and were you consistent in it? Because if, if you lack prayer, you're going to fail. Because without Jesus, you can do nothing. Many of our failures happen because we leave prayer and go in our own strength. We go in our own strength. Like, I don't need God. I'm going to do this. I'm educated. I'm networked. You know, I, I'm, I'm plugged in and I can get it done. No, you're going to fail because you became prideful. And God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And what will he do? He will exalt you in due season. Humility is a, a, a lowering of oneself, a complete dependence upon God, like a child. Uh, humility, what's my definition? Learned helplessness without God. If you don't realize you're helpless without God, you haven't even been humble yet. <laughs> if you think you can do anything without God, you're, you're prideful. In any area you think you can succeed in without God, this is why you don't pray. How, you, how do you own a business and you're not prayerful about it? How do you have children and you're not prayerful about it? How do you, um, how do you, how are you in ministry and not prayerful about it? How, how are you in a, a work position and not prayerful about it? Like what area of your life do you think you don't need God? That's your ego. You're edging God out. God is irrelevant here. I can do this on my own, right? But when we realize how much we need God, it makes us prayerful. One of the things I want you guys to do in this module is commit to prayer. And listen, you, you, you want to commit to personal prayer, but also let's commit to corporate prayer because corporate prayer energizes you at a level you can't do it. Why? One can only put a thousand. I don't care how great Darnell Craig becomes. My one can only put a thousand. Someone cannot be as great as me. But just because we come into agreement, there's exponential power. That's why it's so important. We have corporate prayer. It's so important that you pray as well, because there are things you believe in God for that when we come into agreement with you, it amplifies your prayer. It takes your prayer to a level you can't do by yourself. Nothing is wrong with getting on corporate prayer and you praying for your business. But when you pray for your business, pray for all the businesses. Why? Because we're all coming into agreement and it's pushing us somewhere because now the mind of Christ is here. God will speak. God will be moved by our unity. 
Because whenever believers come together in unity, God commands a blessing in that place. So if we all unify that we want the best for each other, that we're pressing in together, God will bless us and empower us to succeed. You can, Listen, if you want to go far, um, you want to go fast, walk alone. If you want to go far, walk with others. This is not the time to isolate yourself and think that you can do this walk with God on your own. Listen, if, if you have friends in the Lord, you need to be talking to your friends in the Lord consistently. You need to be encouraging your friends in the Lord. You need to be checking in with people that you know who are believers. You need to be praying with them because we need to keep each other encouraged as the day approaches. But what we do is we get into our own junk and mess and then we isolate ourselves and then we only want to come around when we're at our best, when everything is going good, when all our ducks in a row, we want to, we want to be around when God is seemingly blessing us in our perception. Now, realizing we're blessed for breath, blessed for the right state of mind. But when God is increasing us, blessing us and favoring us, we're getting this done. I want to testify. Da, 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 da. But now you're going through hardship, tragedy, adversity. You disappear and you come back. Not realizing that was the place where you prove your worth to Jesus. You prove you're loyal to him. You prove that nothing can happen to me that's going to change my mind about following you. That uh, I'm going to be worthy of you, Lord. Right? You know, the Bible says, I, I think one of the things that, that one of the most powerful promises about prayer. I was going to post this, but I feel like a lot of people, it won't resonate. But there's a verse in the Bible about prayer that you need to always remember. I want to I say something that's going to help you. It's going to be very helpful. Um, there are tragedies you will avoid just because of prayer. I want to show you something. I'm going to show you something. 30, um, Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. It says, but be on guard so that your heart hearts not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. Now watch this. We just talked about yesterday about guarding your heart right? So if I'm not aware, my heart can be weighed down with what? Dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. Many of our hearts get weighed down by dis dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. And what happened? And then when your moment of visitation comes, it will come on you suddenly like a trap. Watch this. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. Every person on the face of the earth will, um, will have a day of visitation. You don't want your day of visitation to come and what happened? Your heart is weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. The Bible says time and chance happens to us all. You don't want to miss your time and chance because you are absent, because you are inconsistent, because you lack dedication, because you lack discipline, because you lack diligence. Watch what it says. Verse 36, it says, but stay alert at all times. Watch this, praying that you will have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Another version says, pray that you be counted worthy. Listen to me good. People who are in prayer will have strength to escape anything that can happen on earth. The reason there should be no fear, why? Because there's no fear in love. But if I'm in the place of prayer, I will be strengthened to endure and overcome anything that can ever happen on the face of the earth. This is why end times messages never created fear. Because if I'm in prayer, God will strengthen me and I'll be counted worthy to escape. So what happens when a believer is missing in prayer? Your heart's going to be weighed down and that day will be a trap upon you. Now watch this. We're going to go back to Hebrews. Um, no, we're going back to Philippians 3. Philippians 3, watch this. Now watch this. So why, why, why am I praying? Philippians 3, 8. It says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish that I may gain Christ. and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness was caused by God on the basis of faith. So remember, we talked about different types of righteousness. There is a righteousness. Uh, there is a self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is when you create your own rules and you say, when I do this, this is what makes me right with God. That's self-righteousness. Then you have a righteousness of the law. 
And this righteousness says that I will strive and earn and perform my way into being right with God. This is the righteousness of the law. And self-righteousness will not justify you. And um, righteousness by the law will not justify you. Now, when I say justify, it means that you will be found guilty. You will be condemned. People who are self-righteous and people who follow the righteousness of the law, uh, when I say this, it's politically incorrect, but they will go to hell. Why? Because they don't trust in the blood of Jesus. They trust in their own effort. They never were looking for a savior. They thought they can save themselves. So if anyone thinks they can save themselves, they're going to realize they needed a savior. So my righteousness is not based upon my works. My righteousness is not based upon my rules. My righteousness is based upon faith in Jesus. Because I believe in him, I'm made right with God. So when I'm in a pursuit of a relationship with God, there is an awareness in my heart that I'm right with God by faith. When you lack relationship, you're going to fall into self-righteousness or righteousness by the law. When you're not in prayer, you're going to try to perform to be right with God. And you're going to try to create a set of rules that make you right with God. But it is the pursuit of relationship that caused me to abide in Christ and to rest in the finished works of the cross and what he's done for me. So I'm not trying to add anything to it. I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but I found my place and this secures my relationship because my relationship with God does not vacillate based on my performance. My relationship with God is solid because of my faith. So because I'm, I'm found in him, not having my own righteousness, but I'm found in him, trusting in him, I'm secure. And I'm not talking about earning salvation. I'm saying my relation with God is secure. I'm not wondering how does God think about me today? You know, I remember a situation happened and I was almost begging God for forgiveness. The Lord had to speak to me and say, hey, listen, you don't have to beg me for forgiveness. But when my righteousness is by him, or if I fall into self-righteousness or I fall into by the law, I feel like I have to strive and earn these things. Watch this. Why else do we pray? So first of all, I want to have the righteousness that comes from faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So these two different things. When I'm in pursuit of God, I get to know him. I want to take you somewhere. We're going to go somewhere real quick. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. This is very important because this isn't just for ministers. Like I said, I know a lot of times, you know, we want to preach and prophesy and cast out devils and work miracles. None of that stuff is relevant without a relationship. Watch this. Um, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you. It says, make your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understand it. So think about this. In the pursuit of relationship, first of all, I had to cultivate an openness to hear God. You had to be open to correction, right? The Bible says, do not despise the correction of the Lord. Why? Because God chastens those he loves or corrects those he loves, and he disciplines the son whom he has delight. If you want to walk with God, God will correct you about your ways. And then also, God will command you to do things. So I had to create an openness to hear the words of the Lord. I had to treasure what God tells me to do. This is the pathway of relationship. Watch this. Verse 2, make your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understand it. So in my relationship, I'm listening for the wisdom of God. Let me define wisdom for you. This is going to be life-changing for a lot of you. If you want to hear the definition of wisdom, and I've never said this before publicly, but I just found this out recently. Let me know if you want to hear this. I want to, I want to hit you with something about wisdom. Talk to me, talk to me. <clears throat> Let me know if you want to hear this. When I, I, it was one, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible that I heard um, in a deeper way, and it was super, super life-changing for me. There's a verse in the Bible that says, um, if you lack wisdom, you ask of God, and then God will give it to you, right? If you lack wisdom. I want to show you something that's so deep about this. Okay, watch this. So. 
Uh, James 1 5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraid of not, and it shall be given to him. So watch this. That word lack, if you lack wisdom, that word lack, it means a shortage, a deficit, a scarcity, or deficiency. So if you lack wisdom, you have a shortage of it, you have a, pit, a, a, a scarcity of it, a shortfall or deficiency of it. Watch this. So that's lack. The next word that we define is the word wisdom. The word wisdom in Greek is the word sophias. And this means enlightenment. It means insight or special insight. So wisdom, theologically defined, is enlightenment, insight, or special insight. Watch this. So watch this. This is what this means. So when you have wisdom, um, just because a person has a degree of education don't mean they have wisdom, right? Because wisdom is special insight. Wisdom, education gives you information and facts. But wisdom gives you principles, solutions, and answers. So anytime you're asking God for wisdom, you're asking God to give you a principle, give you a solution, give you an answer. You're asking God to give you special insight to know what to do. So when you have wisdom, it means you have principles that lead you out of situations and cause things to work again. Watch this. Very, very important. So when we talk about, when we go back to this verse, what we're going to do in our relationship with God, we're going to create a relationship where God can give us wisdom. So my ears are open for solutions, principles, special insight, and answers. This comes from what? From prayer. You ask God for wisdom about how to raise your children. What will God do? He'll give you special insight for your children, principles for your children, answers for your children. And it comes through illumination. God will light your candle, which is your spirit, and there will be an intuition, an intuitive knowing of what to do. This is the pathway of relationship. Watch this. So I make my ear attentive to wisdom. I incline my heart to understanding. So in my relationship with God, I'm listening for wisdom. I'm listening for solutions, answers, insight, and principles. Also, I'm inclining my ear to understanding. Watch this. This is why we pray. When I pray, verse three, if I cry out for insight in my relationship with God, we have to have an understanding that what? If you call upon him, he's going to answer you and do what? He's going to show you great and mighty things you don't know. So my relationship with God, once again, relationship releases revelation. So if I'm, if I'm developing my relationship with God, that means I stand in a position of crying out for insight. God will give me insight in my business, insight in the workplace, insight in parenthood, insight in entrepreneurship, insight in ministry, insight um, in, in relationships. He'll give me insight. So in the relationship, I'm crying out for insight. And what else am I doing? I'm raising up my voice for understanding. And I'm seeking insight as silver. So I value wisdom like silver. And I value understanding like hidden treasures. And what will happen? Then I'll understand the fear of the Lord and I'll discover the knowledge of God. So one of the benefits of relationship, which is what prayer does, is you begin to understand the fear of the Lord. What's the fear of the Lord? When you fear the Lord, you, be you become wise. And it means that you depart from evil and now you're walking in the pathways of God. So my relationship with God causes me to become aware of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean and during forever. The fear of the Lord is what causes me to live a clean life, is what causes me to stay pure, what causes me to walk holy, what causes me to walk in a life that's well-pleasing to God. But prayer does something in me where I begin to discover or understand the fear of the Lord. I understand why do I make the decisions I make? I understand what is well-pleasing to God, what displeases God. I understand why does this reaction grieve the Holy Spirit, right? Because the proof of wisdom is right reactions. When you have wisdom, you respond in a way that glorifies God. You react in a way that pleases God. But if I'm not consistent in the realm of prayer, all these things are blinded to me. 
So I'm actually not fulfilling the words of Jesus because I'm walking in the dark, right? So God is not destined us to walk in the dark. He wants us to walk in what? The light. Now watch this. We're going to go back to, um, we're going to go back to Philippians 3 because we're talking about why do we pray? Why, what's, the, what's the importance of prayer? Watch this. Because I'm not just going to teach you how to pray. I'm going to tell you why we pray. You need to know, the, you need to know why you're praying. Watch this. That I may know him, and the next part, the power of his resurrection. Remember, I prophesied that 2023 is the year of resurrection. Now, this is very interesting. I was talking to Prophet Medina about that today. And he said, Darnell, he said, you know, it's interesting about what you said. And I was, you know, trying to hear what he's talking about. He said, 23 is the number of death. He said, so it's very interesting that you're saying that 2023 is the year of resurrection because 23 is the number of death. It's very interesting. Now watch. But I want, in my relationship, I want to experience the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? It means that God wants to raise me up from the dead. It means that God wants to transform me from the inside out. It means that he begun a work in me that he wants to complete. Prayer is my participation in the inner workings of God. Prayer is my willingness to be transformed. Prayer is my willingness to be a partaker of the divine nature and to walk that out on the face of the earth. So if I commit to the, the lifestyle of prayer, God's going to work a work in me that if a man declare it, you will know why I believe. So when I commit to prayer, I'm experiencing the power of his resurrection. God is, 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 is allowing certain things to die in me. And then God is raising certain things up in me where I can walk in newness of life. So prayer is where I can experience God's resurrection power working in me, where he transforms me into the, the, the God version of myself. When I say God version, it means what God had in mind for me. So when I'm in prayer, God is transforming me from the inside out. And now I experience transfiguration. This means that the real me appears. Once again, you don't know the real you if you're not committed to prayer. You don't even know the best you if you're not committed to prayer. Pray consistently for 30 days, you won't recognize yourself because your desires will change. Your desires will change. Your interests will change. Why? Because you've been imprinted by the world. You think you like things you don't even like. You think you desire things you don't even want, but you're under the imprint of the world. If you get in God's presence, God will do something in you. You won't even recognize who you are. I can, as soon as I begin to pray, I can just tell, like, my choices change. I can tell, you need to be able to know what is the carnal version of yourself. I know carnal Darnell. I've been there, done that. I'd have been in the pig pen. I'd have lost it all. Been the prodigal son, came back home. So I have, I have, a, I have a view of what that is. I know what I look like outside of God. I don't desire that. I don't want to be that. And I, I want to experience God raising me up. I've had glimpses of the heavenly Darnell, the spiritual Darnell. I've had glimpses, but I always had this tendency to sabotage it by being inconsistent or sabotage it by being fleshly or carnal. I would be on this, 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 this crazy euphoria, this ecstatic experience, and I would blow it. And it's like, I, it's like I've mastered bouncing back. But what would life be like if I didn't have to bounce back? I just plow forward. Completely different life, right? So what you want to do is you want to commit to the lifestyle of prayer so you can experience the power of his resurrection. Watch this. So when I pray, what else happens? Watch this. It says, and fellowship of his sufferings. I want to make you aware of something, saints. I want to make you aware of something. It could be a little scary. Could sound fatalistic, but let me be honest with you. If you are a genuine believer, you're going to experience every suffering that Jesus went through. You're going to experience rejection. You're going to experience grief. You're going to experience heartbreak. You're going to experience betrayal. You may even experience death. That's a real reality. But if I'm following Jesus, it is an honor to partake of his sufferings. Why? Because if I suffer with him, I'm going to reign with him. And what does he say? He said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But what? He said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So because Jesus has overcome the world, that's the proof I can overcome it too. 
So when, when I experience his sufferings and fellowship with them, I'm experiencing what he experiences, but also it gives me the opportunity to become more like him because he's letting me experience what he experiences so I can respond the way he responded and I can create the level of relationship with God he created to be an overcomer. Jesus had a rough life. He was betrayed, he was rejected, he was um, persecuted. All these things are part of being a Christian. If you identify with Christ, you will be betrayed. If you identify with Christ, you will be persecuted. If you identify with Christ, you will suffer. But it is an honor to suffer with him. And the Bible says, if any man is suffering, let him pray. The reason you feel so defeated, drained, and discouraged is because you have not went to the comfort place of prayer that's designed to energize you and strengthen you. So you're letting your suffering weaken you rather than allow prayer to strengthen you to stand strong in the midst of your suffering. Because the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that, we're, that will be revealed in you. And suffering is temporary, not eternal. But suffering is a temporary thing that's producing eternal weight and glory in you. And it allows you to experience union with Christ in a way you never could. So when I identify with him, I volunteer to suffer like he suffered. So when I'm praying, when I'm praying, what happens? I'm going to fellowship with his sufferings when, when, I, when I become a Christian. So watch this. I want to be conformed to his death. So there's a death. I must die. I die to self. I die to ambition. I die to ego. There, there, is, there is deaths I'm going to experience, right? I remember my, when I used to pray in tongues, my tongues would interpret and the Lord would say, die daily. Then my tongues would say, die more. And then my tongue would say, die labor. So there were deaths. There was, there was a death in prayer that was happening to me. There, there was a daily death I was experiencing while I was dying to my old ways, dying to my old beliefs, dying to my old goals, dying to my old dreams, dying to fleshly works, dying to carnality, all these different things. There's a death. But then what happens? I'm going to be conformed to his death. So what happened? I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is the pathway of Christianity. To go through these things so God can raise you up into a brand new person. You should be unrecognizable if you're consistent in your relationship with God. If people saw you from the old you, if you're consistent, they won't be able to recognize you because you, you've allowed God to work in you in such a way. And it says God is able to do what? Exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask, think, even imagine. And we stop there. We skip the next verse. It says, according to his power that works in us. You're not going to see God do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine until you let the power of his spirit transform you from the inside out. The reason that we have limitations and lack and we're stuck in places, we're not letting the Holy Spirit work in us. So we have hit that ceiling, the ceiling you can hit without changing or transforming. So if we let the spirit of God work in us, what will he do? Exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. How does he work? by us practicing the presence. If I'm practicing the presence of God, I'm allowing God to transform me from the inside out. This is why I pray when I don't feel like it. This is why I pray when I want to snap. This is why I pray when, when, when it, it isn't convenient, it isn't desirable. Why? Because I'm going through the process of change. I'm going through the process of transformation. I'm going through the process of expansion. I'm going through the process of resurrection. I'm allowing a death to happen in me because unless I die, I'm going to be fruitless. Unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and die, what happens? It remains alone. But if it dies, what happens? It produces much fruit. Fruit comes from death. When you die to self, die to old ways, die to old ideologies, die to old beliefs, what happens? It produces new life in you. You can't put new wine into old wine skins. You didn't just get saved to, for fire insurance. You got saved to be like Jesus. It ain't just about, oh, I'm not going to hell. No, no, no. It, that, that's a low bar. That's a low bar. That's the case. Save me and kill me, Lord, because that's, that's low. But what you want to do is be like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus was in his generation by going through the process. You're not going to do that overnight. Now don't get saved yesterday and be like Jesus today. Now, you're not going to be saving it. Listen, people think that being like Jesus is, oh, man, you know, 
I'll be seeing these people on social media that, that do miracles and healings. And listen, that's so far away from sonship. I'll, listen, listen, I want to listen. Please, I don't want to crush your grapes, but let's be honest. Sonship is the character of Jesus. It has nothing to do with miracle signs and wonders. That, that Listen, you can be a heathen and do miracle signs. You can walk in the flesh and do that. That's not what it is. It is about experiencing his resurrection. It isn't about, I'm telling you, like it, we we set the bar so low. Oh man, I want to, I want to heal people. Listen, you can heal people and be a worker of iniquity. That is low. Why not let God transform you from the inside out? Why not, why not grow in spiritual intelligence, spiritual revel? And listen, we think this stuff is, is relative to, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this and, you know, I'm going to heal this. Listen, you can heal the sick or you can judge a nation. Do you listen? When you look at Deborah, Deborah was a woman who ruled a nation. If God was choosing someone to put in authority, would he choose you? And could God put something in your hand that multiplies and grows? I'm not talking about a church. I'm talking about a business. I'm talking about a movement. Could God let's look at what and forget about what well, I'm not gonna touch up. Look at what God did in Martin Luther King. That's an example. He wasn't a perfect man, but I'm saying. That man was or, or, that man was um, faithful in his metron. If God would initiate something in this generation, could he choose you? Baby Christians can work miracles, by the way. The Bible says these signs follow those who believe. Don't, don't think because someone can prophesy, cast out devils, and heal the sick, they're spiritually mature. Listen, I'm telling you, there are people that have worldwide ministries and are babes in Christ. That's not a son. Sons have responsibility. And I'm talking about overseeing just churches. It's our responsibility. Like when I mature, I'm going to oversee um, educational districts. I'm going to be a superintendent over education. I'm going to oversee colleges and oversee schools. That's when I mature, right? That's responsibility, which means that regions, I'll be responsible for regions based on my call. When I talk about just having a good church and having time and having, you know, revivals and having a conference, listen. Christianity is so much deeper than you think. Paul didn't just have revivals. He changed the world. Did you realize that? Paul didn't have a couple of miracle conferences and come see the miracles and I, I, I'm moving in signs and wonders. No, no, no. He changed regions through revelation. So there's a revelation that God wants to give you in your relationship that brings change. But we set the bar so low. You not realize you want to heal? God get at you in six months. And then what you going to do? start to die spiritually because you didn't hit all your goals oh man you know i'm gonna I'm a heal the sick forget that listen grow in christ let god grow so like jesus that god gives you a work to do because work in miracles is not a work i'm talking about a work that could be a, a business you, god I, you, you're selling yourself short god could have destined you to be a, a big a, a, a bbo a big business owner or own a corporation god can give you the next metaverse the next facebook the next uh, twitter but you you just want to heal the sick that every believer can do all it takes is listen all it takes is one person around you being sick and praying for them goal accomplished you know how low of a goal that is that's low Every believer can heal the sick. Every believer can prophesy. Oh, I want to I want to prophesy so bad. Listen, all it takes you is to be around somebody and God speaks to you. You prophesying now. Is that, is that, that, is that how low the goal is? Or do you want to become like Jesus? Do you want to contribute to your generation? Do you want to leave a legacy? Do you want to inspire your children, your family to know God like you know? That's what I'm saying. Like the goal, we set the bar so low. I just want to have a big church. Forget that. You thinking about a big church? God has so much more than a big church. Why not become a son of God? Why not mature? Well, God can really give you responsibility, like real responsibility. Can you imagine a son of God? I'm, I'm using an example. I, I I hope you don't inspire to be this, but imagine a son of God who was a president, somebody who knows God, can hear God about the nation and what needs to be done. And stand on business, stand on principle, stand on kingdom. Blah, blah, blah. Now, a lot of those systems are corrupt. So that's why I don't engage in that stuff. There's a lot of systems that's corrupt. Church, church system is corrupt. Church system is very corrupt. The government system is very corrupt. 
So rather than be a part of their systems, I seek to create my own. I don't, I don't want to be a part of nothing they got going on. I want to create something that really can bring change. So that's what sonship is about. Jesus was not trying to be the king of Israel. You notice that? Every time they try to make him king, he didn't want to be that. <laughs> but Jesus, if he was king of Israel, he'd have been a political figure. He didn't want to be a political figure. He wanted to be a son. I'm not saying that sons can't be political figures, but you need to know what you're getting yourself into. Please know what you're getting yourself into. A lot of corruption. And I know you want to have a big church and stuff like that. Nothing is wrong with that. But at least have a relationship with God that if I sit in your church, you inspire me to know him more. Not just regurgitate it. Um, things that you've been saying since you were seven years old that you've never like your relationship with God should be inspirational. Your relationship with God should have depth. Your relationship with God should transform those around you in any capacity. If you're a minister, that means when you minister, lives are changed. And lives being changed is not just miracle signs, wonders, healings, and revival. Lives being changed is people, other people being, um, their candle being lit and they, them being inspired to know God deeper. We want to demonstrate, which is deep, but we don't want to, uh, we don't want to transform. We don't want to ignite. We don't want to ignite people to know God themselves. We just want to have like a, a we want to have a miracle, a miracle show and tell or a miracle uh, marathon. We're just going to work miracles all day. People be excited. Da, 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 they worship us. They fall on the ground. It gives our ministry. Forget that. Inspire people who will be movers and shakers too inspire people who will know God for themselves, inspire people who will say things that shock you because they've entered into their own in God, right? Most of the people, you know, there are people now that, you know, when I was younger, I was young, but now, you know, I'm not as young as I was, but when I say things, they know it's coming out of my relationship. I've entered into my own realm, my own distinct realm, and you can't do nothing but honor it because God is with me. But I, I pressed into God and found my place in his heart. And I expressed that. What's your place? You'll never find it without prayer. It's not about healing the sick, raising all that. Listen, that stuff is important, but it's not the focus. The focus is relationship and relationship breeds revelation. And your relationship, God's going to give you revelation that transforms you. He's going to give you a revelation about the covenant, revelation about um, his, your identity, revelation about your destiny, your purpose, your calling, revelation about who he wants to be for you. And over time, it's going to change how you do everything. And then the uniqueness of that will be you functioning as the light of the world because you're going to illuminate other people to know that God is so much greater than they realize. So listen, I want to stop right here. This was the art of prayer part two. We really got into the why of prayer. So I hope that tonight encourages you. So I want you to consider what I say. May the Lord give you understanding. But I want you to commit to being consistent in prayer, both privately and corporately. Those who are missing corporate prayer, I want to encourage you to join us because there are things that are happening in corporate prayer that you cannot do on your own. So I see you guys again tomorrow. We're talking about manifesting destiny tomorrow. You guys enjoy your night. Hi, everybody.